so just so people know, I'll be recording this session so we can put it up um, uh, for people to watch later. Um, but yeah, so so if you ask a question um, using audio, I think it may appear on the track. I'm not 100% convinced. We've not tried this feature before, but if you ask it by chat, it won't. But I'll just repeat the question for everybody. Okay, so that's that's three o'clock. I think there's a good turnout. We have about um, 18 or so people in the room. Um, you should be able to hear me. You should be able to see me as well. So as I said, you're welcome to ask questions anytime during the talk. Um, just type it into a chat window if you want, or or maybe try the audio. Um, so it's up to you. I'm happy to take questions. It's quite informal. I'm happy to take questions as we go along, or, or I can take questions at the end. So um, first of all, Welcome to this Archer virtual tutorial. And as I said to people here early, the main reason that the function of these tutorials is uh, to give an, a sort of open discussion where you can you can ask any question you want about any aspect of the of the Archer service. But to try and promote discussion and, and get people interested, I thought I'd give a short talk on something which I think is is interesting and, and perhaps not as obvious as it, as it might seem, and that's PBS job submission. So um, this is the virtual tutorial. Um, and uh, uh, PBS job submission. I'm David Henty. I, I, I'm mainly in charge of, of training. I work for Arch for EPCC and, and the Archer CSE service and training is one of my main responsibilities. And you can see the logos of all the people that are involved. Just to say like all our um like all our uh training uh this material will appear on, on the website um, shortly, um, and you're, you're free to, to reuse it as long as it's attributed in the standard sort of commercial um, Creative Commons, as you see there, non-commercial share alike. So we will make these available on the web. So what I thought I'd start with is kind of <laughs> trying to have some kind of analogy. Um, a day in the life of a PBS job. Oh, I've got a typo there already, PBS jobs. A day in the life of a PBS job. So, I mean, what happens is you start and you write a, a, you write a batch script in, in, your, in your editor. So, so that's what you do. Um, and then you, um, then you submit this to the PBS batch system, and that uses, uh, the, you use the QSub command there. And then what happens then is, Is that it's held in a queue until it's able to run, and that's the point at which you're um, you're twiddling your thumbs um, and hoping that your job will run, hoping it runs correctly. Then subsequently, um, it's executed, and I'll explain exactly what happens there. But and, and I'll come back to this later. But hopefully, what your your script does is it uh, launches parallel jobs from the script, and again that's um, that is done in a separate stage um, from the execution of the script itself through AP run. And then finally, it's completed and, and, and job output is, is written. And again, that's possibly not quite as simple as you might imagine due to the way that the file systems and such like are set up on Arch, which I'll explain. So this is the kind of cradle to, to grave kind of cycle of a PBS job. And what I'm sort of doing in this talk is going through each stage and trying to explain, as I said, why. Um, it's not necessarily as simple a, a procedure as you as you might think. So I see a few people are joining a little bit late. Um, as I said, this is just the first slide, and if you want to ask a question, feel free to type a question into the chat window or to use the audio. But if you are using the audio, please make sure that you, you have to click actively click talk, and and please make sure you unclick talk when you finish talking, so we don't get any any feedback. Okay, so so the conception of a job right at the start is you, you write the batch script, and again I'm, I'm starting from a basic level here. But what is a batch script? I mean, a batch script is really just 
a list of commands that, in principle, you could have just executed at the command line. So you type ls, you type print, you type echo, and you could have typed them all at the command line. You just stick them together into a script, so they're all executed concurrently, well, in order. And we recommend that you use bash uh, as, as a script. I know some people use other uh, other shells. Uh, that can that can be slightly problematic. So if you especially if you're starting from new, you should use bash. Now the only thing you really need to know, other than it's a bunch of commands run together, is that lines starting with hash are comments, except for a couple of notable exceptions. Now in general, this uh, hash exclamation mark is special to the, to the operating system. And so you'll see at the top of your script you have this, this strange incantation, hash exclamation mark bin bash minus login minus minus login. And that tells the uh, OS to run this script using bash and also as if it were a bash login session. Now that's recommended on Archer. It, my understanding is it means that the session you run under PBS is as like as possible the session you have uh, in your normal login session, for example, modules and such like. There's some subtlety with modules, um, which on the Cray stuff might be able to sort out, uh, explain in more detail. However, for this talk, the, the, the important one is the hash PBS. So hash PBS would look like a comment at the end for the hash, but the PBS system uses that as a way of passing arguments. So hash PBS are special, they're interpreted by the balance system. So in general, with PBS, you have two options for you have two mechanisms specifying options to the to PBS. One is on the command line, and the other is to use um, is to use a hash PBS um, minus n my job. It's exactly the same as doing uh, minus n my job uh, when you when you launch a job. So some sort of obvious questions you might have. You might say, well, that's great. Okay, so I can just run a batch script in advance. If I want to check when it's going to work on Archer, I just run it in advance on the login nodes, and if it works, it works. OK, that's fine. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Why? Well, your batch script actually doesn't run on the login nodes. It runs on a different computer with a slightly different environment. And that's where some of the complications lie. Often, you don't encounter these very simple um, parallel programs and simple scripts, but they can bite you later on. So you might think the obvious thing is, OK, there's some commands that work on the login nodes that aren't going to work under PBS. That's the obvious thing you might think. In fact, that's not true. It turns out there's some commands which don't work on the login nodes that will work under PBS. So unfortunately, and it turns out it's, the main one is AP run, the way you actually launch parallel jobs. So unfortunately, it's not completely trivial to um, debug um, your scripts um, there is a way of doing it, which I'll mention at the end, but it's, it's not completely trivial to debug your scripts because anywhere where you have AP run, if you do that on, on the login nodes, it's going to fail because it's not, it, it's not capable of running parallel jobs. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem, but we can, we can cover that later on. The interactive parallel job is a way of actually getting around that problem. So, okay. Conception is writing the script. The computer thing, the birth of your script is submitted to the batch system. Here I'm q subbing um, my job, myjob.pbs, and on Archer as opposed to Hector, you select nodes with minus l select equals six. So I'll come back to this, but it's very important that um, all you specify in the PBS script is how many nodes of Archer you want to use. How you, even if you use them later on, it is up to you. Uh, on Hector. It was a slightly strange system where you could effectively, you could you could give complicated instructions to P, to, to PBS to QSub, but it would then work out how many nodes it thought you needed. It's much more clear on on Archer. You just say I want six nodes, and all you need to know is a node has 24 cores. And we'll come back to that. Now, what PBS does here is it takes a copy of your batch script. That's very important. It does copy your batch script and stores it somewhere. It also looks at it and ascertains the resource requirements, which, as I said, on Archer is quite simple. Um, you would just say select equals six, so it just knows you need six nodes. It could get that from the command line with the minus L, or that could have been a hash PBS line, but it works out how many nodes you need. And then it, your job is queued until the resources are available. And so in this case, it will wait till there are six nodes available. And then at this stage, your QStat job status is set to Q for queued. So, so if you do a QStat, you'll see that your job is, is in the queue state. Um, 
in terms of um, the other things you might do uh, when you do the select, the only thing which is really relevant on Archer is you might ask for a serial job or you might ask for the high memory jobs. So it, there's a way of specifying that you want the high memory nodes and then it would, it would wait until, in this case, six high memory nodes were available. So, okay, so that sounds great. I queue sub my job. I can just edit because the back system has taken a copy of it. I can edit the script and resubmit it straight away. That sounds obvious. Well, it's not really that simple because, of course, what you're probably doing from this script is you're running an executable. And the executable, so when the script runs, it could be in an hour, it could be in tomorrow, it will, you'll specify a path to the executable. It will run the executable that is there when the script runs. So if you're running a package, that's fine. If you're running NAMD, step, some big central package, that's great because the effectively you, you know you're going to be running the same executable. But if you're compiling and running your own codes, you have to be careful. It's very, I've done this myself. I've compiled a code. I've Q-subbed it. Thinking I'm Q-subbing the code, of course, I'm not on Q-subbing a script. I've then recompiled the code with different options and done another Q-sub and kept doing that. And of course, when my jobs run, they just all run the same code. They run the last one I compiled. So if you're going to do that kind of thing, you have to be careful, have to be quite rigorous and run in sub different subdirectories. That's clearly a way of, 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 of um, making sure you pick up the correct executable at runtime or possibly the correct input file, which you may be changing as well. And then you might ask, how does I actually decide when to run my job? Well, it's it's... There's a, there's a high-level policy which tries to make, in some sense, the most efficient use of Archer. It's a balance of how many nodes you've requested, how much time you've requested compared to all the other jobs in the system. This is you know, internal configuration, and this is constantly being updated to try and make, um, make best use of, of, of the whole system. The major difference between Archer and Hector is that there are not on Hector, this was implemented by having a lot of individual queues underneath, which you could see. You could say, oh, there's a one hour 60 node queue. There's a three hour 256 node queue. That's not done on Archer. It's a much higher level view. And some users aren't so happy with that because people could sort of play the system before. They could say, oh, there's not many three hour 64 node jobs in our, I will submit one. However, from the, the highest level, it's much better that we do this. We, could, we have much more control over the system. But the important point is that means you should take care when specifying your requirements. So if you think your job's going to run for 10 hours, don't say it's going to run for 30 because then the batch system's going to say, well, I'm going to have to wait till there's a 30-hour slot available. You should try and, and be as close as possible to your requirements. Now, if your job's going to run for 10 hours, you probably don't want to request 10 and a bit because it might, you know, might be a bit slow and might be killed. But if you add 10, 20%, that should be OK. It is important that you, for your benefit, that you're as close as possible in your requirements uh, to, to, um, to, what you, um, to what you're actually going to use. Because the only information PBS has about how to schedule your job is what you tell it. You say how many nodes you want and for how long. And, and if you say it's going to run for 30 hours, if it actually runs for five minutes, well, PBS doesn't know that. It schedules based on your, your stated requirements. So that's quite important. So OK, we've gone through conception and, 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 uh, and birth. I would say the childhood is when you start to walk, that at some point, the resources become available and your script is run. So instead of compute nodes has been reserved for your job, PBS said, right, I found six compute nodes. I'll let David have them. The pro but the, the slight confusion then is your batch script is executed, but it's not executed on the login nodes. It's not executed on the compute nodes. It's executed on some intermediate nodes called the mom nodes. Now, mom nodes are clearly called mom nodes because they, they chaperone, they mother your job. And there's some backronym saying it sounds from machine-oriented mini-server, but clearly that was invented post hoc. At this point, your QStat job status is set to R. Your script is, your script is running. However, all that's happening is your script, your set of commands, is running on these mom nodes. I'll indicate later where they are. The only way to access the compute nodes is with AP run. And so, you know, unless you do an AP run, you'll not be using the compute nodes. They'll sit there idle. You'll still get charged for them. You know, we charge you for how long the nodes are, are reserved for you, whether you use them or not. So I've jumped ahead of myself a bit, but what you would do here if you want to run the job is, I remember I did select equals six. This is where you need to know that Archer has 24 cores per node. 
as opposed to hectare, which had 32. That's quite an important difference. 624 to 144. So the most obvious thing to do is AP run minus N1 for my MPI program. But it's worth now looking at how the system is set up. This is the first system, first picture where I've shown uh, your own laptop or desktop on the left, the login nodes, which you are familiar with probably, the compute nodes, which is the main um, um, section of, of Archer, I have 3,008 compute nodes. But in the middle of these mom nodes, you may not have known they existed. And they're colored gray, the same as the compute nodes, because they're actually really part of Archer, the main Archer system. They're in the Archer network. In Archer, the login nodes are very much decoupled. They're, they're really, on, on Hector, that wasn't true. But on Archer, the login nodes are really just standard servers sitting outside the network. And, and that's good. That means the login nodes stay up if Archer goes down. So you can still do pre post processing, development compiles, and such like. Anyway, so you, you, your, your laptop might be running, it might be a Mac, it might be a Windows machine, it might be running, might be running Linux. Um, the login nodes run a full version of Linux, so you have a fairly standard environment there. And also the mom nodes are effectively the same as the login nodes um, in their setup. So they have a full version of Linux there. So your script will be able to do all the things that you expect to be able to do. The important point, though, is that these compute nodes have a very um, stripped down Linux here, a thin penguin. And this is one of the reasons why Archer is able to, to um, uh, achieve better performance than a, off the shelf, than a, than a sort of self-built cluster is that the operating system on the nodes has been tailor-made to make most efficient use of those nodes, and it's been very stripped down and um, customized for HPC. So the job flow, I'm using sort of the same diagram here, you go from your laptop to the login nodes with SSH. There are multiple login nodes. You're, you're just assigned to a, a one. There's some load sharing mechanism. Then when you QSub your job, it's submitted to the PBS system, the um, batch system, which is running on some other system, which I haven't really, um, really indicated here. It's running somewhere. But the important point here is that the PBS takes a copy of your script and stores it away. So you're sitting there, and you could sit there for a while. But let's assume we've waited a while, and suddenly, there we are. Six nodes have appeared. So I now have six nodes available to me. That's what I asked for. So PBS will be notified these, these, these nodes are available. And at that stage, PBS will say, OK, I've got this job. You know, I want to run it. I now have my resources. And it runs the job on the mom nodes. So the script will run on the mom nodes. And then at some point, if you've written a, a normal script, you will execute an AP run command, which will launch a parallel job on the compute nodes. But that's the only way you can get stuff on the compute nodes is to run AP run from the mom nodes. You can't run AP run from the login nodes, which is why you can't easily debug a whole script just by running it. You might say, well, if I was logged on to the mom nodes, could I not do that? And yes, that's true. And I'll, I'll mention at the end how to do that. So OK, that's your, your childhood adulthood when stuff really starts is when you, um, when you want to run a parallel job. So the compute nodes are reserved for the duration of the job. You have, uh, we give out the minimum quantum of, of scheduling is, is a node. You always get a com complete node. Now, PBS doesn't care if you use them or how you use them. PBS is just, at this stage, PBS is out the picture. It said, I've run your script. I've given you um, your nodes. That's it. So all commands are executed on the mom node. It just happens that if you run AP run on the mom node, it actually um, runs uh, parallel jobs on the compute nodes. And AP run does the following. I mean, AP run does a lot of things. But in terms of the, the job flow and trying to understand how the file system interacts with the job flow and what you can and can't do, the two most important things are, A, it broadcasts the executable to all the compute nodes. So you do AP run my MPI job, a copy of my MPI, so AP run my MPI program, a copy of your MPI program is sent via the network to every compute node. That's quite important. And then AP run also gathers the standard outputs from all the processing, processing elements on the, all the MPI ranks. So how do the file systems work? And this is this is where you might under, you know, why do I care that? If, if the mom nodes look like the login nodes, why do I care? I mean, they, they, they can do AP run, but it seems fairly minor. Well, I've shown here on the news um, 
icon here on the right is the slash work file system, a very large high performance Luster file system. And that's grey because it's sort of part of the of the main Archer system. Uh, slash home is, is really just a, a standard home file system. It really sits on the login node. So that's why I've colored it uh, the same color as the login nodes. And the important point is the login nodes are attached to, attached to slash work. That's so you can do pre and post processing. The mom nodes are attached to slash work. And the compute nodes are attached to slash work. The compute nodes clearly have a very, uh, you know, attached with a, with a lot of bandwidth because that's where we want you to do your main application I.O. The login nodes are attached to slash home. You, whenever you log in, you see your slash home, your slash work file system. The mom nodes are slash, attached to slash home, but the compute nodes are not. So that's the, this, is, this is the asymmetry which can catch you. So on the login nodes, you can see home and work. On the mom nodes, your script can see home and work. But once you've AP, when you AP run a parallel job onto the compute nodes, it cannot see home. And that's why we recommend that you run from slash work because then you know, all three systems that you're concerned with, the login, mom, and compute nodes can see slash work. So that's really you know, the, the fact that compute nodes can't see slash home um, is not obvious because in your batch script, if you do ls minus l slash home, you will see it. But that's because your batch job is running on the mom nodes, which can see slash home. Your parallel job running on the compute nodes can't. So then, I mean, I could call it death, but I've called it retirement. Your job finishes after all the commands in the script have been executed. And that isn't as, as bland a statement as it might seem. Or the wall clock limit is exceeded. So at that point, all your parallel jobs are, are killed. So if you exceed your wall clock time, your job is killed. But also, if there are any AP runs still executing when your job finishes, they're also killed. And that can happen if you're running AP run in the background. And I'll show why that's useful later on. And there's a, a subtlety which you have to be aware of there. Standard about this output is collated and written to my job. So although um, the compute nodes can't see the home file system, your myjob.o can appear on the home file system. That's because the compute nodes aren't writing directly. They're going via the, the back script, the the AP run command, which is actually running on the mom nodes, so that the AP run kind of takes in all the all the um, standard outputs, and then can write them where where your job is running. They can be written to slash home. So the main point here is if you um, if you just in the testing phase compile and run an MPI program that does nothing but do some compute and write to standard out, you wouldn't see any difference between work and home. It's they would both seem to work. You wouldn't see a difference between running in slash work or running in slash home. They both appear to work. However, it's if your MPI job does direct file access, does an F open or, a, or, or Fortran open, you will see that, that the, um, the compute nodes can't see the home file system. Your Q starts job status is sent set to E. This is annoying. I don't think this happens on Hector. It looks like it's in an error state. It's not. It means it's exited. And for some period of time, five, ten minutes, I'm not sure what, under QSTAT you will see your job as an E, and that means exited. It doesn't mean error. So, and then it disappears. This is, I find slightly annoying, but that's the way it's set up. So that's trying to give you an idea of, of how the job life cycle goes. But the main way you run parallel jobs is to issue an AP run command within your script. And that's, again, not as simple as you might think. So if the obvious thing, I can do one AP run. I might want to do multiple AP runs. So if I select six nodes, I have 144 cores, and I have three data sets to process, I can do AP run 144 cores, 144 cores, my data set one, data set two, data set three. And they'll just run in sequence. And often a single job with multiple AP runs uh, maybe more convenient for you than um, than than many than, than three jobs. You could do Q sub job one, job two, job three, or you could just Q sub a job which runs three runs the executable three times, has multiple AP runs, and that that's quite useful. Especially if you have large numbers of of jobs, that's really really worth doing. But AP run is actually quite clever. AP run is is sort of a mini scheduling system in itself, and that allows you to do um, 
interesting things. So imagine we only want to do 72 cores. So we, we've asked for 144, but for some reason we, our job maybe doesn't scale very much. We only run, want to run on 72 cores. You could do the following. You could do AP ROM on N72, my MPI program data set 1, N72, my MPI program data set 2, data set 3, data set 4. All of those jobs would run on 72 cores. So you don't have to use all the cores. Again, at this point, um, you can't use more than you've been allocated, but you can, but you can run on, on fewer than you've been allocated. Though actually, as it's written, this script is, is not, this isn't technically incorrect, but it's not going to do what you want, what I've written incorrect here. These will run sequentially, so you'll only be using half your resource. AP run blocks and only returns when the job is finished. So these will just run in, in sequentially, which isn't what you want. It means you'll not use, um, use all the cores. So the obvious thing to do is, well, what you normally do in Unix, let's run them in the background. If you run them in the background, it will return immediately, and then we can run another job. So this is the obvious thing you do. You have your four AP runs, but this time, you run them in the background, so you stick an ampersand after every one. That looks that will launch uh, all those AP runs uh, consecutively, uh, sorry, simultaneously. However, this is incorrect because if you look back to what I said earlier, I said that your PBS job finishes then after all the commands in the script have been executed. Well, the final AP run, AP run minus N72, my MPI program data set for ampersand is executed. Then it gets to the end of the script and it finishes. So the final AP run returns almost immediately. The script reaches the end and finishes, and then your job finishes and all your AP runs are killed. So this, this script would run for, I don't know, 30 seconds while everything was AP run, and then it would just die and everything would die. So that's not what you want. So what some people then do is this. They say, I want these four AP runs. I'll put them in the background, but I'll be clever. I'll not put the last one in the background. That'll fix the problem, OK? So that seems reasonable. But again, it's not correct, because this means the script will finish when data set four finishes. But maybe some of the other data sets are still running. Maybe data set one was a slow one. So maybe data set one was still running. Data set two finished. Data set three finished. Data set four finishes. Your script finishes, it runs off the end, runs off the bottom, and everything dies. So if you want to do this, and it is quite a useful technique, you need to be aware of another command. So the, the right thing to do is to, is to if, you, if you've requested 144 cores, you want to run a lot of 72 core jobs, you should do this. You should run in the background, but then there's a magic command, which is wait. And this says, don't go beyond this point till all the jobs I've spawned previously have finished. And this is correct. This will then execute all the AP runs, wait till they've all completed, then, then carry on the script, fall off the bottom of the script, and, and your job will, will, will complete. And AP run is quite clever. What it will do here is it will run data set one. It'll then realize there are 72 cores remaining, so it will then run data set two. And then it will wait until one of those finishes, and then it will run data set three, and then it will run data set four. So, so um, it's not scheduling, but it is, it is keeping count. And if there are resources out of your pool of 144, if there are resources available, AP Run will put your job there. So it is able to manage multiple jobs uh, within the constraint of the, in this case, the six nodes which we've been allocated. So it, it's, it's pretty clever, actually. So if you want to do something like a task farm, which is a bit more dynamic, you could do something like this. You could run a 72-core job, a 36-core job, a 72, a 36, and 36. You launch them all. And what would probably happen here is that it will run the first one. That leaves you 72 cores left. It will run the second one. It can't run the third one, but it will go on and say, well, the fourth one, I can run that one. So those four, three will be running at once, one, two, and four. Then I'm assuming here that data set one finishes first because it was run 72 cores, maybe it was faster. Then it will go back and oh, I can run data set three now, and then it'll find it run data set five. So AP run is 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 um, it doesn't look ahead, it doesn't look ahead like uh, PBS does, but it is you know managing the resources quite in quite a dynamic way. So I just wanted to check that I'd answered the questions which I said I would. So I've answered some explicitly. There's three which I haven't answered explicitly, but hopefully I've explained what they are. 
One of the things I said I'd, I'd explain is why can my job script see my home files, but my MPI program can only see my work files. That's because the script runs on the mom nodes, which see slash home, but the MPI jobs run on the compute nodes, uh, which only see slash work. Slight weirdness is why can I store my MPX, MPI executables in slash home, but not its input files? You might say, well, if the compute nodes are going to run my executable, they have to read it. So, you know, how can they possibly read the executable from my home file system? But then when I try and open an input file, which is in the same directory as my executable, my MPI job says can't open slash home slash data dot in, for example. Well, the reason is that just like PBS takes a copy of your Q sub script, of your, your PBS script at Q sub stage, AP run broadcast the executable the thing you, you ask it to AP run is broadcast directly to the compute nodes, but it can't broadcast any dependent files. It doesn't know that your, your MPI job is going to read data.in. It can't broadcast that. So um, that's why you can, start, it's very, you can have an MPI executable and some data files in a home, in a, somewhere in your home file system. You can launch the MPI job, but it can't read the files which live in, in the same directory as itself, which can seem a bit weird. How do interactive batch jobs work? You, should, you can look at these up on the uh, on the man pages, but you can effectively we can say we, you can submit an interactive job, and that allows you to run AP run from the command line. And this is the way you can debug your script. You submit an interactive batch job, and then within that you can just run your script as if it were a bunch of commands. And the way I think of it is, you're effectively running a job which is just a bash shell on the mom nodes. You're effectively logging, you are logging into the mom nodes. You happen to do it via a Q sub command, and that allows the batch system to, to know you're there, and, and, and it does attach resources to you. So when you, if you Q sub interactive job, you still ask for compute resources, and they will be allocated to you. But then once your job runs, you just get a command prompt back. You've effectively Q sub the bash shell. And then you can, you can play around, and that's very useful for quick turnaround, compile, edit, um, uh, debug run stuff, but also it allows you to, if you have a complicated script which does lots of things which might go wrong, you want to check they all work, you, you can do that by running it just as a normal bash script um, on a mom node, and you can do that by, um, by QSubbing an interactive job. So, okay, that's the end of my talk. Hopefully, I've explained some of the um, some of the, the technicalities of PPS that might, I don't know, make you ask more questions or might explain some of the behavior you've seen. Hopefully that, you know, now we're not, we've transitioned from being not very happy with PBS to being a bit more, um, a bit more happy with it. So I'm just about on time. I thought it might take about half an hour. Um, as I said, the main reason for these sessions is, is to, to get discussion going. Um, I'll try and answer questions. Uh, we have um, Tom Edwards from Cray is on call if you have any Cray specific questions. But I'm happy to take any questions, as I said, either by audio or by, by text on anything I've said now or anything at all about Archer that you might want to know. Okay, the question is, is there a way to get an estimated start time on jobs in the queue? That's a very good question. Um, so, okay, so okay, so I'll ask, is there a way to get an estimated start time on jobs in the queue? That is very interesting. Um, on other systems I've used, that there must be ways of getting estimates. That's, I'll take a note of these. It's a very interesting question. I mean, things are very dynamic. So, you know, what maybe the estimated start time now may not you know, may change. It's not, it's not pre-allocated. You know, it doesn't. When your job comes in, it doesn't say. Uh, for example, you know, your job could come in wanting 24 nodes, and PBS might look at it and say, you know, there's, there's got nothing. There's going to be nothing available for the net a week if the queue is very, very, very um, full. But of course, its its projections 
forward, its projections forward are based on what people requested. If someone requested a, a long job and it suddenly finishes early, uh, maybe um, uh, maybe th then nodes will become free and your job. So I suspect it will be possible to come up with an, an estimated upper limit, which is likely to be an upper limit. But that's a very I mean, we had a student. We've had students at the past write effective MSc students effectively write simulators where they can um, play around with alternative job scheduling strategies. You can feed it a load of jobs, and it can schedule them virtually, schedule them, and something like that would be you. You could run the current workload through. Um, okay, so um, ah, okay, okay. So, some, so Scott, that's okay. Q stat minus T. Um, so I don't know who, who, who Scott is here, but um, thanks for the, okay, so Q stat minus T is, uh, is useful. Um, so yeah, policy changes, previous update, the estimate time for the job. I mean, I can't guarantee, my, 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 my inkling would be that the actual run time will be, sorry, the actual job launch time would typically be earlier than PBS estimates because it will take a conservative view based on the resources. And up to currently, we suspect that, that, that users overestimate their job time. Uh, that may be a hangover from previously when our, our run times were quantized. There was no dis if, if, if you want, if the queue length was six and 12 hours, it didn't make any difference if you said it was a seven hour job or an 11 hour job, but now you should try and be a uh, you should try and be um, honest. Can PBS send emails when it starts or finishes a job? Um, now, I'm sure it can, uh, unless there's something specific about the query. Typically, systems I've used have emailed, and people find it very annoying. It can definitely send emails. I know that because if you do something, um, if you do something completely wrong, which PBS can, can, yeah, it can send emails. Um, I don't know how to do that. Uh, my, my suspicion is it can send emails, um, unless there's something funny about the way that the connection works. Um, I don't know. Um, I said my experiences in the past is that that's actually been, um, not useful <laughs> in the sense that you tend to get lots and lots of emails. Uh, so, but, I mean, by default, it will be turned off. But let's think if I should open up. Unfortunately, I'm not in my usual setup at the moment, so it's, it's difficult for me to open up. But normally, I just open up a shell. And um, let's see if we can. Um, sorry, this isn't very seamless, but um, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I was trying to kick up a. a I was trying to kick up a shell with Putty. Um, but I seem to be having problems. I'm getting a, OK, I just, there's some slight problem with my account. So apologies, I'm not able to log in at the moment. and. Um, um, Okay. So, um, so yes, Scott, that's, we've got the answer here. So I was just trying to um, chat the questions. Can we send emails? So, okay. Ah, of course. Sorry, of course they're not. Yeah, of course the system is down today. Sorry, I, I, I Tom, right? Of course. So I, I, I got a slight. Um, the system is down today for a, 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 a system, quite a major. Um, 
upgrade. I could log on to the TDS, but OK. So someone's saying they're getting quite variable uh, run times on the serial jobs. So the reason for that, we are looking at this at the moment. I mean, I've actually been away for a couple of weeks on various holiday and, and, um, and conferences and such like, but we had a, a team meeting on Tuesday, and this was one of the topics of discussion. The, the serial nodes are, are very much just general purpose you know, big shared memory Linux boxes. So they don't have this tight um, tie down that the, the compute nodes do. And, um, and a side effect of that is you see variability. For example, if you're doing I.O., somebody else could be doing a lot of heavy I.O. Um, if other people are hammering the, 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 um, the CPUs, they may be using up one well, the memory bound, but they may be hammering the memory system. So um, So, um, so that was Susan. So that is a that that we the the, um, the serial nodes are just um, are just that they're they're provided by Cray, but they're just sort of standalone Linux boxes, and they do suffer from this variability as being a shared resource, uh, unlike the compute nodes where they're only given out um, to a single user at a time. Um, so Susan asked that question. It, how variable is variable? Is it a factor of two, or is it a factor of 10%? Or you, uh, are you doing a lot of I.O.? Um, OK, that's quite severe. 22 minutes, 1, 2.5 hours. I mean, are you doing a lot of I.O.? Um, that that could be. I mean, we could be saturating the I/O. I mean, I should say this was a topic of discussion earlier this week, and we're going to set up um, more uh, monitoring scripts on these um, serial nodes so that they can, um, you know, if someone says that the job ran slow and it ran, you know, three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, we could have a look and see what the symptoms were, and then try and cope with that. Uh, I mean, for that kind of variability, which you should talking about, like a factor of, you know, that's a factor of eight. Yeah, I mean, my, if somebody else is doing file O of that size, then that could be it. It, it could be a bottleneck on, on, the, um, on the file. But there may be ways around that. Um, so, on the serial nodes. As I said, we'll keep an eye on this. Um, and So there's got, Susan saying, instead of jobs one after the other, processing several files sequentially. I, I suspect that it's it's um, that it's contention with other users. Um, OK, so Tom's saying here that um, you can do post -process, pre and post-processing on, um, on, on the compute nodes. Of course, that does cost you a use, but you know, 
you're only using a single node, so um, it would be an interesting comparison. So I just saw another question from Starignus. Uh, for running interactive, there is a wall time where it's available to test queue. So um, I'm going to answer the question from Starignus just now. Um, I don't quite understand it. So when you run interactively, you 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 queue, you, you, you queue sub an interactive job, but you, you give a wall time limit. You say, uh, you know, I would like a shell for an hour. And you will then get a prompt back, and you will be logged onto the mom nodes, and you can do whatever you like. And after an hour, it will just die. You know, you'll suddenly you won't be able to type anymore. There is also so so that's the inter you do specify a walk clock limit for the, for the interactive jobs. It can be whatever you want. There is a test queue. There's a debug queue, and um, I can't. I have used it myself actually. Um, I can't quite remember the syntax. Let's see if I can find a. I seem to. Have, I'm. I'm working with multiple screens, which isn't something I normally do, and that's why I'm being a bit slow. I guess just minus Q debug. Fine. I was. I was. I was just about to say that, but before I. So there are limits, yeah. So, so for the debug queue is just a um, for doing quick turnaround. Um, so, so you could submit an interactive job to debug queue. You would, you would only get, you know, 15 minutes or so, but that would probably be the way of guaranteeing that you got on. As I said, when you because you the interactive access is via the batch system if if you do if you queue sub an interactive job but ask for a lot of resources it will wait a long time you know, until they're available potentially wait a long time until they're available so it won't necessarily come back to you immediately um, so i'm just scrolling back to check i haven't missed anything i think we're okay so far If someone has a question, it would be good if they tried talking. Um, just something I'd quite like to um, see if the if the audio works both ways. In principle, it should, but So we're happy to answer questions about anything to do with the Archer service. It doesn't have to be about PBS, anything to do with parallel programming, um, anything at all. OK, it's a question from Oliver. Is the login method the same as Archer? Are all the libraries on the Hector available on Archer? Yes. I mean, well, that. Um, they will, but I can't guarantee they're all there at the moment. But if there's, I mean, if there's something available on the Hector, then either it will be available on Archer. If it's not, you can just send in a query, and we'll, we'll, we'll try and get it installed. So the porting process from Hector to Archer has been, um, hopefully for most people, relatively straightforward, um, because although the hardware has changed, um, it has different processor technology and different interconnect. The the whole software stack is is the same. From Cray, so any comes sticking all your files into my software. Suppose I show up. Ah, very, that's a very very good question. Okay, so 
the Splash Work File System is um, what I'll do is I'll do. Oh, um, something seems to have gone slightly funny with my session. Uh, okay, so there's something funny with my session. I don't seem to. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, go back to my slides. But that's. So I'm just trying to get the slides up again. It's just slightly strange. Uh, okay, so you should be back up again. Uh, slightly bizarrely, I have to say, stop sharing when I want to start sharing. So I'll just zoom through these slides. That's one of the problems with. Uh, Animations is when you want to go through slides quickly. It always takes a while. So this is the next one I want. Okay, fine. So these are the connections, right? So as you can see, uh, the connection between the compute nodes and slash, uh, well, the, the connect the, the connection the compute nodes and slash work is, is 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 wide. So slash work is configured for doing large volume I/O. So you want to write, you know. 500 gigabytes and such like, and so it's a parallel file system. That's very, uh, it's very good at doing that. The, the 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 disadvantage is that it's things like opening files and small file manipulations are very are relatively slow, because the idea is if you're going to be writing a you know terabyte file, okay, it doesn't matter if it takes a second or two to open it up. That's you know completely washed away by the fact that you have this fantastic I/O bandwidth. The problem is when you compile, it may not be obvious, but compilation involves creating vast numbers of small files and linking here, there, and everywhere. So, when you comp if you compile in slash work, the disadvantage is that com compilation can take quite a lot of time if you're compiling because it's, it's having to create lots of little files. So what I do is I I compile an edit in slash home. I should do it this. My, I'm good if I'm looking at it in slash home. Uh, I'll use the cursor. I compile an edit in slash home, but run from slash work. But rather that says well, that means every time I run, I have to copy the executable from slash home to slash work. But what you can do is you can put a soft. You can link from slash work over to the executable in home. So if you do all your compile and edit in slash home and all your run in slash work, um, but you link the executable, a soft link from slash work back to home, that works. The reason that works is when you run AP run on the mom nodes, it sees a soft link and slash work, but it can resolve that and copy it from slash home. It's a trick. It's the only file you can do that with because it's so you can't link your data files and such like, but so I don't know if that's very well explained. But that's what I tend to do for large applications. I do compile, edit, and such a cycle in slash home. I have a separate directory where I run from in slash work, but I I link the executable back so that I don't have to keep copying it. I don't know if that made um, if that made sense, but that is the downside to compiling in slash work is that um, opening, creating small Little file manipulations are relatively expensive. They have a high latency. Ah, so as Tom says, ah, yeah, okay, fine. Slash work is not bad. So that's the other reason for for compiling for doing that in slash home. So if I, you know, uh, uh, slash work is not backed up. So that's the other, that's the other benefit of doing your compile edit in slash home. You know, if your major resource is your code, um, which it probably is, and that's the thing you least like to lose, having it in slash home is better. Now we have not had any in the lifetime of Hector and Archer. That's six years. I don't think we've had uh, any problems on slash work. But now there is not a purge policy. A question from Joseph. You are. Uh, projects are given our um, 
a an allocation, a quota on slash work that depending on the, the policy of your project and your principal investigator, that may be subdivided into sub quotas. But we give a project, you know, 50 terabytes or something, and that's for them to use. There is no purging, but there is no, um, uh, there is no uh, backup. Um, we would really, I mean, uh, by discouraging I'm concerned, I mean, we, you should never ever write files to slash temp because that can cause system wide problems if it, that fills up. And that, at least on Hector, we aggressively purge slash temp because it could, uh, filling slash temp could have, um, could have um, repercussions for all users. But no, there's not a purge policy of slash work, it's, it's, but you do have a fixed quota. That's why we don't need to purge or, or why we leave it up to the users. Could I store my bash scripts in my home bin or to execute them in slash work? Uh, yes, in the same, yes, yes, uh, yes, exactly, yes, you could, uh, yes. In slash, in, in, in slash work, you could queue sub slash home slash whatever and then that would be yeah that's fine because actually the the the, the um the, a copy of the bat script is taken even e even at q sub time so that would be copied to the login node would on the login node um yeah so as tom says a very useful variable dollar pbso work there um for such a useful variable that has a strange name but basically what I tend to do in all my scripts is the first thing at the top is cd dollar pbso work. So what that says is go to the directory where I was submitted from. It may not be obvious, um, but when you run a batch job, it starts off in, um, I was going to say it starts off in your home file space, but as Tom, that wouldn't work. Yes, it does, because of course it's on the mom nodes. It starts in the home file space. So, so I think a good policy is to always you know, have CD dollar PBSO work done. I think our test scripts have that. Um, they, they, they start, but the, so that means that your, your, the first thing your script does is, is, is go back to where it started from effectively. Okay, so Tom is okay. So this uh, this is a nice trick actually. So um, Tom is is saying that you can avoid clashes in jobs by um, by basically uh, having your your bat script create a um, a subdirectory based on its job ID, which is guaranteed to be unique, and, and going there. And it's also useful to actually take a somehow or other take a copy of the script that ran, because often you can go back and look at the job output from three months ago and you can think, hmm, I don't really know what the script options were, so cat dollar zero will 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 cat will will um uh will effectively the script will concatenate itself. So so that's that's quite a nice um if you're doing benchmarking or something where you need to remember the entire environmental setup for when you ran a job, um you, you can sort of semi-automate that and each job can go to its own directory, can dump a copy of itself in that directory and so you can go back later on and, and see, see how it, um, uh, uh, and be able to reconstruct exactly what its, its, um, uh, what its parameters were. For example, you know, you can specify a lot of parameters to AP run to, you know, how you space the jobs out, how you allocate um, jobs to, to um, ranks to nodes and it's, it's not obvious unless you keep a copy of your bat script, which has the AP run command in it. It's not obvious what you used later on when you go back and look at it again. So especially doing benchmarking, um, trying to optimize parameters, this can be very useful. I mean, it sounds like there seems to be a... I'm taking some notes. Some kind of hints and tips 
for running jobs is sort of a is kind of and um sorry I'm just taking notes myself. Might be useful. What's minus P, Tom? I can't get man. Make parents. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. So, it, okay, it makes okay. Yeah, so you don't have to you don't have to, you don't have to make do a dollar p brush for dollar make. Okay, fine. Oh, I didn't know that. So, I ought to have been using Unix for thirty years, and I didn't I I didn't know about that. You learn something every day. Ah, oh, that's a very good question. I say out the father buffered. So um, now you have to be careful here. If you're writing to standard output, like write star comma star or printf, uh, you can try and flush those buffers, but they will just be flushed. They're still going to be buffered by AP run in some way. So um, do you mean, are you writing to a file here or are you writing to standard out? Just a quick question there. Are you actually writing to an output file or are you just doing write star, star, comma, star, or printf? Okay, so what I do is it, so, so you can, oh, uh, I mean, you can you, you can if it's if it's C, you can F flush FP if or FP is your your output file, and that that does flush. In fact, um, it does actually work to stand it out for, for slightly strange reasons. Okay, so Tom is saying, so I think a sign is on a a sign is on a per file basis, isn't it, Tom? You can say assign these properties to this file, and one of which might be don't buffer it. Is that what you mean? But for within the code, I do f flush of fp or in Fortran, I think it's I think it's flush of unit. That's I mean. The standard code which I use on our introductory courses, your kind of 101 first code you've run, A does input and output, and that's deliberately specific, you know, F open or or you open. It deliberately does that so that you you it won't work if you run it in slash home. Um, but secondly, I have got all the flushes in there because on some systems where it's buffered, you want it to come out. So, I, I, so Tom is saying that you can tag or effectively mark a file as having properties with a sign. Um, and I'm sort of saying that you, well, you could also try flushing from within the, um, flushing from within the, uh, uh, the, the code. The other thing you can do is, Oh, conversion history. Okay, fine. Yep. And if you, that's a bit more difficult, you want a conversion history. If you just want to know, if you've got five stages in your calculation, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, what you can do is you can create a file and then close it, and it and that will then appear. So, um, you know, if you want to just say, you know, I've got four stages in my calculation, I want to know where it is. At the end of stage one, you could open a file called stage one dot finished, right junk to it. And then close it. Um, so that 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 you know the open close there allows you to uh, monitor. Also, if you, yeah, I would try flush. 
and if it's Fortran F flush in C or flush in, in Fortran, or uh, as Tom says there, at least for Fortran I/O you can do an assign. I've used assign in the past for uh, buffer sizes and things. So okay, so I said I've used it for buffers. So I've used it in the past to have large buffers to increase file. I/O um, performance, but Tom's saying here you can. I assume that set buffer to zero. Okay, but that's only going to work with Fortran. Fortran has quite a sophisticated I/O subsystem, whereas C is much more raw. So, um, Yerne, uh, is it Fortran or C your your um, that your code is written in? No, in Arch you have direct access to your work directory. You don't. You don't have to. Um, okay, so we've got just just to finish off your next command, you, I would either try flush of unit number from within your code, or uh, Tom said you can uh, you can external. I guess in your script you were doing a sign on the file name. Saying that it should be unbuffered. So, um, starting this says, in actual to redact our temporary file generation running to temp file, can we sort our work directly? Um, I mean, the standard procedure would be to store them in your work directory because that's, you have control over that and, um, it's your, I mean, it's given to you. You know, you will, your your project or your users are given. We give you a block of workspace, and uh, and that's what you can do. You can clean them up at the end if they're temporary. You can clean them up at the end with your script or something. Uh, your, the final thing your batch job could do would be to remove all the all the temporary files. But um, the work file system is where we would um, recommend they're stored. It's the it's the high performance file system. David, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Yeah, this is Andy Sunderland from uh, Daresbury. Oh, hi, Andy. Yeah, I just thought I'd, uh, I thought I'd speak a question just so you could test out the software anyway. Yeah, you're Andy Sunderland 1. Does that mean there's more than one Andy Sunderland? Or? Well, anyway. I think I might have logged in twice at the same time somehow. And I don't know. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, just on this, so Tom just suggested uh, some useful commands to make unique directories for your yep. job. Based on PBS job ID, if you're say task farming a load of different jobs within the same job script, and you want to make unique directories for each of those EP runs, if you like, within the job script, yeah, so are you doing that through any environment variables? Um, so I've just paused because could you hear me, Tom? Uh, Andy, sorry, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, so I've just had a strange message up saying hosting is paused on my. Um, it might be because I've not moved anything. I'm just slightly concerned that something's gone wrong. It sounds like it hasn't. Let's see if it's. It might be because I haven't moved the slide for so long. Hi, Andy. Um, can you see me or hear me? I can hear you. I can, Tom. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. okay. I'll, I'll just. So uh, that's a good question. You could do it manually, but you probably want an automatic. Does does AP Run return any kind of ID, Tom? Does it? Is there any? Is it some return code? Well, uh, that wouldn't help with well, it because you need it before. Well, so you if, you, if you're inside one job, um, you mean something like what would be the MPI rank for that process in AP Run? Yes, I mean. I, I, you might have to you might have to build some kind of wrapper script around your jobs to do this. I acknowledge that. But there used to be a thing called on IBM systems. There used to be a thing called MP Child, which was just a unique identifier. Um, yeah, that's a feature which we've been looking for for a long time um, on the Cray system, uh, as just as analysts ourselves, and it's finally coming through. Um, I'm not sure it's available on Archer right now, but eventually you should be able to get access to it soon. Um, what I would recommend is the only way to really make a unique name is probably to do dollar host dollar dollar, but that's not uh, that would be random effectively, but it should be unique. 
Okay. If that makes sense. So you're getting the process ID through dollar dollar, and then the host name would be the host name of the node that you'd be running on. So you would get a unique um, directory for each of the processes that you started, but you wouldn't it wouldn't relate to the MPI number, and you couldn't rely on there being a certain range or anything like that. Um, we're working on a way to fix that for if you run. Okay. So you would access to the chart to the to the basically the MPI rank before you start. Okay. Uh, any idea what that you say it might be available on other systems? So any idea uh, what we have it available very internally, um, and uh, it's there's a push to get it out, so it will need to be released as a package, I think, um, okay. and also configured on Archer. That may take a, a while. Okay, I'll look out for that. Thanks. What's the terminology going to be for that, Tom, just so people know? It'll probably be an environment variable. They'll be called, you know, um, variable. So it, it, set, it will be set up for each, it'll be a configurable thing for the system. So it'll right. probably be something like, I'd wait until we get the okay. release on Archer before I commit to anything. The alternative is to write an MPI application that sends fork execs or something, the script that you want to do, but that's a bit more heavyweight. Uh, Mr. Lee Cray is not well set up for task bombing in its default state. There is a utility we have, I think, called Task Farmer, which will be installed um, part of the CSE, which should help, but that's a slightly different thing. OK, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually doing it the way you suggested, which is forking from um, uh, a bash script at the moment. Um, it's, not yeah, it's not particularly elegant. Yeah, it's not an elegant way of doing it, but it, it, it works. <laughs> um, I had some experience with this last year with an MSC project, at least on Hector, and it was, wasn't obvious to me to do with process placement, if you have a script and it forks something, does it run on the same core or does it go to the next one along? In which case you might worry that the spawning so, script is using up a core that's not being used, if you see what I mean. If we go into very if, if you were to do that, I would recommend using the taking the binding off with C C man because you are so what will happen is it will go on to the next core modulus by the size of the D option, which is the depth by the okay. So it would potentially be bound to the same core if you want. Right. Or it would be um, the next core if it was bigger than that. D was bigger than one. But probably what you want in those situations is just for the seat to be able to just manage it for you so you say speaking now. Okay. Just for getting a bit of typing, I don't know if it's it's not me, I don't know if it's or talk. okay, it's fine now, sorry. Are there any more any more questions? Okay. Pablo Um so um there could be a number of things here. So so when time is allocated, it is um there's a special budget called reserve, which you can't um you can't charge jobs to. So 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 by default, all the time is put into the reserve budget, and it is up to uh, the principal investigator or, or someone who he's given the authority to move that into the usable budget. This is to, this is to make sure that you know if you've been given a million hours, that one user can't act and use it all up in, in, in one go. But when you're allocated time, it goes into the, uh, to the highest level. It goes into the reserve budget, which won't show up in budgets, I think. Uh, so. You definitely can't run a job from it unless the PI or a man or an appointed manager has moved some um, resource from uh, the reserve budget to the the project budget. Uh, that could be the issue. Uh, I, I 
don't, as I said, we can't log into the system just now, but I suspect budgets doesn't report the reserve. So it might be useful if it did, because um, that would make it obvious you would see that you, um, Unfortunately, Stephen Booth, who uh, wrote the budgets code, isn't isn't in today. But that that would be my guess. Uh, um, I wonder if I can. What's your project, um, Pablo? What's your project identifier? Uh, is it, it Z something or other? Or that might be useful to me. E two eighty. Okay, so I may. Uh, have sufficient privileges to, to I'll see if I can find that out. Give me two seconds. So there was a Okay, well, what about the no excuse and examples group? If you go to, to www.archer.ac.uk, there is good documentation there. There's a user guide. So the Archer user guide um, is there. We are. It's very, it's very good. Um, it covers all um, the documentation as about the nodes, the queues, and, and and there's a number of example scripts there, from simple ones through to more complicated ones. I mean, AP Run has a lot more options to do with. Process placement and such like, which I haven't, um, ha which I haven't uh, covered today. I was mainly uh, concerned about. Okay, details of all projects. E two eighty. Okay, E two eighty. Um, so E two eighty um, Adrian Mal Holland and Emma Davis are project managers. Uh, you, so Pablo, um, yeah. So if you're an E two eighty, I can see from this on the project manager. So Professor Adrian Mal Holland, who's the PI, and Miss Emma Davis is a project manager. They're the people who can move budgets. It it looks to me like. The E two eighty. So the uh, okay. So um, there's a default budget, which is E two eighty, which everyone can access. So you have access to that. However, some projects decide to. Um, have sub budgets and it looks like that's what E280 have done. And so in the um, in the in in the main E280 budget there there is no time. So so I'm just guessing here, but it appears that the policy within this this this, this consortium is to give um, everyone their own uh, budget. So I can see here that uh, there are one, two, three. Yeah, you'll need to contact. Uh, Adrian Mulholland or Emma Davis um, to ask about that, but I think I can see what's going on. They've got a policy where you would have to be given a sub budget uh, of your own, and they haven't put any time in the global budget, which everyone has access to. So, uh, Or maybe you should be given to uh, who's your um, so this is to Pablo, who's your supervisor? Do you have? Sorry, I don't know your status. Whether you're a, 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 a PI yourself or whether you're a, a student who has a supervisor. It, uh, but 
but definitely you'll need to roster. Okay, so um, there is a budget called E280 roster. Now you may not have access to that, but uh, E280 roster. So my guess is that that's the one you should be using. That's my guess. You need to check with uh, Dr. Roster. Uh, um, uh, you will need to be so. You will need to be enabled to have access to that budget. And it's not clear to me from this um, who, who 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 can do that. Um, Dr. Roster may be able to do it. May have to be Adrian Mulholland or Emma Davis. But there is time in that. So, so that if it's true that you're, if I'm guessing right, that E280 roster is the right budget, that's the budget you should charge to. But you, you will not by default have access to that. That needs to be arranged. But it's within the project. So either Dr. Roster or the PIs or managers will be able to do that. I don't know if that helps. So you'd need to do something like Q sub. If it was me, you know, you minus A uh, E two eighty dash. I mean, if there was E two eighty dash henty thing, I when I Q sub the job, I'd have to say minus A charge the account E two eighty dash henty. You can try E two eighty dash roster, but you may that may not be initialized. Okay, well, good luck. As Tim Wright said, if I sell you, for instance, I've been through one PS, I think, can I force into one specific? Ah, uh, can you? Okay, but um, we, me and Tom were discussing this this morning that uh, I. Okay, so if you don't put them in the background, then they block, so they run in the order they're there. But the, the, the question is, if you if you submit lots of them into a, effectively your pool, and you let um, if you submit them in the so so if you just if uh, let's go so let's let's have a look. And maybe if I if I get my slides up, which I have here, so maybe this actually. I'm still struggling slightly with this. Um, so I'm going to have to go through the whole. Um, it's to do with the, the way that multiple screens works with. Um, I'm not very good at this. Yeah, this is disadvantage of animation. Okay, fine. So, uh, hopefully, you should see that slide. So, so Morris, those. So, those will on that slide. Those will run in order because the AP run goes off and will not return until that. Data set one is complete. These will also run in order because again, AP run, although you're not using all the resources, AP run just blocks, as Tom said, until it finishes. So I guess the question is if I do this, the order I don't think is uh, you'd have to put a weight in. I mean, the way to, to 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 batch them. If you want to batch them up and have them also with some ordering, you'd have to do a bunch of them and and then and then do a do a uh, a wait. So I don't think AP run. You know, I don't think there's any um, guarantee here that you know when jobs one and two or two finishes, then job three will be the next one that runs. I'm not sure. Me and Tom had a bit of discussion about it this morning, but definitely, my my 
you know, if you if you want to have ordering or dependencies, you'll need to uh, process, you'll need to manage that yourself um, with a script. I mean, when you run these AP runs, you will get back a process ID, and you can probably do some testing on that if you're a, got a bit of bash knowledge. But I don't know if that helps much. I'm not. I don't quite know if we're answering the question that you that, that you want answered. But those ones will run in order. It's only if you put Lamphazan, you run the background that there is any um, that the, the AP that that there is any decision to be made. Yeah, so I I think that if you if you're running in the background and you want to impose some ordering between a batch of jobs and another batch of jobs, you'll need to put a wait in to, to ensure to enforce that ordering. Yeah, so Tom's saying here. I mean, there are there are situations where it's useful, but it it does introduce some complications. And it's um, you know, the simplest thing would be to run. Uh, uh, well, then you do multiple queue subs, but uh, yeah. So Tom's saying here. Of course, if you do multiple queue subs and you want to enforce job ordering, you don't have that either by default. But what you can have, yeah. So that can be quite challenging as well. Okay, so this is okay, so yeah, so this is um uh a single AP run, but using the MPMD um, uh, multiple multiple um, program, multiple data attribute SPMD model, whereas single AP run can run, um, yeah. But as Tom says, that's a single MPI com world. So th th this is saying um, run multiple different executables, but um, have them all be part of. Um, um, have to be part of uh, yeah the same world. So that could be that is a different thing from running yeah that so that that is a different thing from running uh, from running those three uh, uh, separately. It's a subtle dip. Well, I don't know if it's subtle. Dip. It has, as Tom said, it has quite. Uh, uh, they're not independent programs. What you're doing there is you're taking independent executables, making them part of the same program. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. The minimum quantum for AP run is a is a node. So um so I'm happy to keep taking questions. I've been drinking a bit too much tea, so I'm gonna take a two minute comfort break and be back um literally in two minutes. But I don't know if Tom wanted to, to cover um, while I'm now, but um, as I said, I'm welcome to, to be on the line till five, uh, but I, I just have to take a quick break. Apologies. I'll still be here.
<laughs> okay, so uh okay, so I think that's been um, it's been successful. So if anyone has any any questions, I'm happy to carry on taking them. If there's not any more questions, I might let me close the session in, in a few minutes. I tell you, I'm still happy. We are still happy to take questions if you have any. Yep, thanks for attending. Uh, okay, yeah, so we um we will be putting these slides up on the web and they'll be linked into the, the virtual tutorial page in some way. We haven't done won't we'll do that immediately because we hadn't originally envi we'd originally envisaged the um, the virtual tutorials being purely um, discussion sessions, but we felt actually that was a bit difficult to do. So sorry, that would be better to have a topic. So uh, we hadn't originally set up the pages t t to link to presentations, but now we will. So it will go up on on the Archer web pages um, soon, um, and you, you'll be, they'll be linked in from the slash training slash virtual page, um, but uh, it may take a couple of days just to get to, to come up with the best um, way of doing it. But yes, our, our aim is to put all our slides on the web. That, we haven't been able to do that yet due to sort of local issues, mainly to do with the changeover from Archer to, from Hexa to Archer. The, the, all the web stuff was, was changed over, so um, we didn't want to do stuff which was going to get undone at the switchover, but now we're in a stable situation for the next four years, so we will we will start populating the website with the training material. I'll take a note myself that just so I don't remit, forget. So actually Liam, you're down as Liam number two. When you if you if you log in and say you're called Liam and there's already a Liam there, does it say there's already a Liam? Is that why people have had to put uh, um numbers on the end? I didn't I've never I've not logged in as a user before. Okay, fine. That's no problem. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I thought that was I thought that was the more likely explanation. <laughs> 